In this video, we're going to look at the MITS Programming System 2 for the Altair. This package allowed you to use your Altair as a development environment for assembly language programs. It included an editor, a debugger, um, and assembler, of course. Now, what makes this package historically significant and unique compared to other similar editors and assemblers is that when this package was for sale and when it was in use, there was no floppy disk drive option available for microcomputers. There was no CPM or Altair DOS environment. Instead, this package allowed you to do this development using nothing more than a teletype and paper tape or a CRT and cassette. And when you think about all the file I.O. that has to take place in the typical cycle of edit, assemble, edit, assemble, debug, start all over again, um, you realize that's not an easy job to do with a cassette tape, at least not to do it efficiently. But this package does a pretty good job of it. Now it's still nicer working off a of floppy, but this really isn't too bad. Alright, we're going to demonstrate it using uh, cassette, the Altair 88 ACR interface to a cassette. And when you purchase this package from Altair on cassette, the first thing on the cassette was the actual monitor itself and we boot the computer and load the monitor just like we would for basic. Once the monitor is in the computer, then you can use the monitor to load the editor, the assembler, run your programs, that kind of thing. Alright, so the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and fire up this computer, give it a reset, I'll go ahead and set these addresses, it switches to zero. And at this point, as always, we have a computer that has nothing in it. It doesn't have the ability to read from cassette yet. So we're going to have to use the front panel to put in a small program that allows us to, that gives the computer enough smarts to read from cassette. After that, the first thing it's going to read from cassette is another more sophisticated loader called the checksum loader. That will then turn around and read the monitor off of the rest of the tape. Alright, as with BASIC, we go to the manual and look, and Altair has provided bootstrap loaders for us to put in, depending on the type of I.O. card we're loading through. Now we're loading through a SIO board connected to an ACR, so I get the bootstrap loader for the ACR and we'll put it in here at location zero. Alright, the first byte is 41. So I'll deposit that into location zero. The next byte is 256. 256. I can use deposit next to put that into the next location. Alright, 1761. Twenty two and zero. Three thirty three and six. Seventeen and three thirty. Three thirty three and seven. Two seventy five, three ten. 55, 167, 300, 351, 300, and 3 and 0. Alright, so the bootstrap loader is loaded. Let's go ahead and reset and set ourselves back to address 0 so we can execute. But before we do that, we need to set the sense switches to tell the system what type of serial port is being used for the console and what type of device we're loading through. Now, on this older version of um, software, it doesn't use the same sw sense switch settings that you've seen us use in a number of the other videos. And those, you'd set the console as a code on these four, you'd set the load device on these four. But this corresponds to the same settings we'd use for Altair Basic 3.2, a bit older. And on that, to specify the serial port we're using, which is a 2SIO board, you'd raise switch A11. On a 2SIO, if you want one stop bit, you raise A10. To tell the loader that we're using a cassette, you, load, you raise A15. So that tells us we're loading 2SIO, one stop bit as our console, and cassette as our actual load device. Now specific to this monitor, a9 tells the monitor whether or not you want to use serial input interrupts or not. If you have your serial board strapped for interrupts, it's good to use it because then you can actually control C uh, executing program and jump back to the monitor. 
So A9 down means interrupts on, A9 up means interrupts off. So we want them on, so we're gonna have A9 down. All right, so now we're ready to run, and uh, I'm gonna get up, move over to the cassette, and get that started next. All right, I'm gonna hit play on the cassette, I'm going to run the program, and then I'm going to reset it briefly and let it run again. Now the reason for that is because if there happened to be a garbage character in the UART from the cassette recorder, then that would upset or, or cause the load process to fail. By letting it run for a split second there, it cleared out any characters that might have been there. When I hit reset, it actually started it all over at zero. So at that point, we know there's not any garbage characters left. Just kind of a little trick to improve the odds that a cassette boot will work. All right, that light transition you just saw is going from the bootstrap loader that we put in on the front panel. It has now jumped to the um, checksum loader, and it is running. Now, the monitor itself is only about 2.5K, so this will only take another minute and a half or so. While that's loading, let's go over some of the monitor functions real quick. One of the main things the monitor does is provide a centralized I.O. mechanism for the entire package. It does this by providing a mapping between some logical devices and then the physical device you're actually connected to. And you, the operator, can tell it what logical devices connect to which physical devices. Alright, so one of those devices is the console or the TTY. We just leave that map to our console because anytime a program wants to read or write to the user, it'll come right through our serial terminal. All right, a second device is called the ABS, or absolute device. Anytime a program wants to read or write an executable absolute file, it does it through the ABS device. So for example, when the uh, monitor wants to load the editor, it does it through the ABS device. When the assembler wants to write binary object code, it does it through the ABS device. We want to map that to our cassette recorder, and we'll show you the step of how to do that. Now another type of I.O. is editor I.O. So when you want to load a source file and save a source file, and for that matter when the assembler needs to read a source file, it does that, okay the tape just finished loading, let me stop it. It does that through a device called FIL or file. And what the file device does is either go through paper tape or cassette or whatever you want. In our case we want that coming from cassette as well. So we're going to go ahead and enable that for uh, cassette I.O. Another device is the LST or list device. So when the editor wants to provide a nice listing or the listing from the assembler, you can assign that to whatever device you want. All right, we can tell from the light pattern and uh, from me stopping the tape that we're booted now. So let me go ahead and get over to this screen. The command prompt for the monitor is a question mark with a couple of spaces before it. Those spaces are very brief um, error messages are displayed in those spaces. Um, it works a lot like CPM in that if you type a command and it's an intrinsic command, for example, examine 50,000, that's octal, as a built-in command, it actually just goes out to 50,000 octal and shows you what's in that location in octal. Um, and you can also deposit, and there's a few other commands built right in. If, it can't f if it's not a built-in command, then it goes out to mass storage and tries to load a file, an executable file, that has that command name, just like CPM. However, in CPM, it goes out to disk, it can't find that file, it just gives you an error message quickly. Here, it's going to hang forever until you provide that file. So you want to type very carefully, otherwise you'll end up having to restart the monitor, which is a little bit of work. Um, all commands are case sensitive, so turn on caps lock, do it all uppercase. Alright, what we want to do now is load the editor into memory. To do that, we just type the name of the editor, EDT. It's not a command, so it's going to go out to try to load that from the mass storage device assigned to ABS. Now when the system per first powers up, all logical devices are assigned to the serial port, which would make sense if you're using a teletype and a paper tape. But in our case, we need to assign the absolute device, which is what is used to load programs, to audio cassette. To do that, there's a built-in command called open that assigns a logical device, in this case the ABS device, to audio cassette. Now when we type a command and it can't find it, it's going to go to the audio cassette to try to load it. So I'll type in the editor's file name, EDT, hit return. It's now waiting for that to come in through cassette tape. I'm going to hit play on the cassette. 
and it will now look for that file called EDT. The binary files that are saved include a header that has the file name in it. All right, now this is going to take a couple minutes to load, so while it's loading, I'm going to go ahead and do a video cut. All right, that's finished loading, and the editor actually just came up and started running. That's the command prompt for the editor. You go I for input, and you can type some stuff. Control Z exits input. P prints it, so there's the one thing we typed. E exit the editor back to the monitor. Now we can enter the editor again now by typing EDT. Since it knows it's loaded into memory, it doesn't have to go back out to disk, or excuse me, tape to get it. So as long as we don't clobber the editor, we have it in memory. Next thing we want to do is load the uh, assembler itself into memory as well. So the name of the assembler is AM2. So if I type that command in, it doesn't find it. So now it wants to load that from tape. It happens to be the next thing on the tape, so I can just hit play. And it will scan what's coming in from the tape and um, look for the assembler and load it and start it up as well, just like we did with EDT. All right, again, this will take a few minutes, so we're going to do a video cut while it loads and come right back. All right, so the assembler has finished loading. And now we're seeing the assembler's prompt. I'll go ahead and stop the cassette. And now we're in the assembler. Now the assembler, you can actually type commands in directly. Um, it's an interactive assembler, but it can also read from a file, for example, that was created by the editor. To exit the assembler, the command is EOA, end of assembly, at which point you are back to the prompt of the monitor. So at this point, we have the editor in memory. I can type EDT and use the editor, or I can run the assembler. Oops, okay, so I typed the wrong file name. So here's an example of why you need to be very, very careful, because now I am stuck. Except for the fact that I'm using interrupts, I can hit Control C and get Control back. Now that only works since I signed it to the cassette. If I was still coming in from paper tape or the console, the Control C wouldn't have worked there either, and you would have had to reset from the front panel. All right, AM2 is the name of the assembler. You can see it's still in memory as well. So at this point, you're ready to edit, assemble, edit, assemble, edit, assemble, and work on getting your errors and, and debugging the syntax. And you can actually run your program as well without the debugger and still have the editor and assembler in memory. So you could do a lot of work at this point without having to spend any more time reading and writing files. And we're going to get to um, the details of that in the next video where we'll start right at this point with the editor and assembler all loaded. Now if you did this without me talking the whole time, this whole procedure would take you about six minutes or so. So you could get up and running, editor and assembler ready to go in about six minutes. Um, not great, but not bad. And if you were careful, you didn't have to do much of that uh, other loading and reloading in the meantime. All right, well, that's it for this video. Again, the next video will start here and show to how to actually use the editor and assembler. Um, the computer used in today's video is actually an Altair 8800 clone computer. This computer accurately duplicates the look and feel, the features, and performance of a real Altair, but it does it with modern hardware on the inside, so you don't have to worry about damaging a vintage computer while you run all these great old exercises from the old days. It's a great thing to have in your collection. Be sure to visit the folks at AltairClone.com to learn more about that great computer.